on my am I on? All right. All right, well, good morning, everybody. All right, so my name, as she stated, is Joshua V. Barr. V stands for Virgil. And she went through some of my credentials, so I won't go through them all. But, you know, it's always interesting when I hear someone really go through my, go through my stuff. Um, yeah, I've had these degrees, and I have traveled the world some. I lived in Colombia, South America for a few years, uh, greatly impacted my life. Uh, I left Colombia in 2012 and then came back to the United States uh, after kind of finding my way, for se. Um, and uh, I got three degrees, which means I'm heavily in student loan debt. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so in the eyes of some, when you look at some of these things, ah, he's a success. Uh, I've, I've been a uh, staff counsel or civil rights attorney for the state of South Carolina. Uh, I was state fair housing director, and I was also, uh, presently I'm the director of the Civil Human Rights Commission here in the city of Des Moines. Now, our mission here in the city of Des Moines is to eliminate and prevent discrimination uh, in order for people to move up the social economic ladder. Uh, that is our purpose. We want people to advance in life, to thrive in life. Uh, so this is a big part of why I'm doing this, because actually for me, uh, working with youth is very important. So when they called me, I told them I was in. Uh, it was more so just a matter of scheduling, and we did it. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. Now, you know, I like to get real in my discussions. Uh, education means a lot to me for which when we first go through this ride today, you'll be like, really? Why does it mean so much based on the story you're telling me? I'm sad. So, um, <laughs> but we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the people. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about this boy. This boy right here. Uh, he's, a very, he's very near and dear to my heart, because uh, he's me. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I really wanna talk about this kid. When you look at this kid. Now, when you look at this person, what do you see? Because let, let, we're actually going to converse a little. I'll ask a few questions to the audience. Don't feel like you have to be just listen. I don't like the lecture. I don't, I don't actually find lecturing very impactful. I like to interact with people. So when you look at this photo, what do you see? Happy kid. Happy kid. Anything else? Style. Style, thank you. Thank you. That was actually in my notes. That was actually in my notes. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, I see that too. Ah, cause she put me in those stylish clothes, right? Yeah, Mama did that. I re actually remember this day. A anything else? What? Uh, what? What? What does that mean? <laughs> so I look devious. Really? I, I first time I got that one for that photo. All right. <laughs> All right, well, I th throw out some other words I had in there since you, somebody did say stylish. I also put handsome, <laughs> cute, <laughs> twinkle, you know, the sparkle in the eyes. So, you know, this photo was taken in 1983. So I'm about to show my age. I was three, I was, uh, three years old when this photo was taken. And you know, I'm, I'm technically a tweener. I'm between... Generation X and uh, millennials, so I can kind of flow with either one. Millennials are typically known for always being around technology. They, they've had access to technology since the day they were born. Technically, that's true for me. 2600 Atari, Nintendo came in two years later. Uh, I've always been around technology in some form or capacity. So I do have some uh, Gen X tendencies, especially with regard to my work ethic, but I'm, I consider myself a millennial for the, for the most part. Now. This boy has a great smile. He looks happy. Somebody said that. Uh, this smile would melt the heart of any lady. You know, I was always, I, when I was a kid, I always like older women. My mom was like, what is wrong with this kid? Like, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but when you look at this photo, you know, people do grow up and people change. So what caused the transition? Let's look at the transition. All right, so let's fast forward uh, 13 years later, 1996. Anybody notice anything about this photo? No smile. Very serious, yeah. 
<laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we ride with those two. No smile. He's very serious. The smile is gone. And the smile has actually been going for a few years. It actually disappeared in 1993. So probably three years before the smile disappeared and life got real. Uh, the smile isn't the only thing that's gone, though. His sense of innocence is gone. He's been waking up and awakened to real life, per se. You know, in elementary school, life is just so, uh, as we used to use the term back then, gay and happy, uh, where you just, you know, life is just wonderful, butterflies and everything is just wonderful. Then you go to middle school. Middle school was just, I hated middle school. Anybody just love middle school? Only, uh, only like three people raised their hand. <laughs> and that's actually when you kind of speak to the norm. <laughs> I hated middle school. It was horrible. The worst experience I ever had in my life. I still, I don't have nightmares about it anymore, but I don't ever like to think about it. You know, I have one friend I still communicate with from middle school. He's like, you remember that time? No, I don't want to remember. Like, no. <laughs> so, I don't want to remember. So this kid actually transitioned. So when I look at these two people, I, once again, these memories are near and dear to my heart. That's one of my earliest memories, taking that photo right there. Um, that memory, I was in high school when I took that. I was in 10th grade. And from 1985 to 1992, the kid on the left was an all-star student. Uh, he received President's Awards. He received A Honor Roll all the time. He received the Principal's Award, went to all these events and got uh, awards and presented in front of people. He wrote uh, uh, articles and they were posted in the newspaper and he was just an all-star student. 1993 to graduation from high school and beyond. Things changed. The student suddenly became in and out of trouble. He went from an all-A student to a CD student uh, with occasional flares of brilliance. And we'll talk about those occasional flares of brilliance in a moment. He spent his seventh grade year in in-school suspension for the most part. I never really, I, I remember all my teachers, but my teacher I encountered the most was Ms. Davis. Are right, you back again, Mr. Barr? Yes, I'm back. All right. So, multiple write-ups. Failed the 12th grade. I had to go to summer school to graduate. And guess what class he failed? It was like a real simple one. Oh, did they give you in the 12th grade? Uh, uh, oh, I didn't, yeah, we were done. I failed English. Made it all the way through school and decided last year, I'm going to fail English. Hey, <laughs> really? Who does that? <laughs> all right. Of all the subjects, and I graduated with a 2.3 GPA. Does that sound like college material to you? Nah. Now, the one thing I do fail to mention was that this kid was always in college prep classes. He, and sometimes advanced prep, that was available. But this kid, he was gifted, but did not rise to his level of brilliance. And the reason why I always got stuck in advanced prep and college prep classes is because when you take those tests at the end of the year, they say, ah, oh, this kid is really smart. And so I would just sit in the back of class and just, this let life go past me by, but technically I could never get out. And I'm from South Carolina, by the way. So uh, if you are a, at least, and that's still somewhat true, because I talk to people now and they still say it's true, but if you're a black student in college prep classes in South Carolina, you are considered a white boy. Hey, you, you, are, you are not black. You, you are, and I was flunking. I wasn't doing that high, but you know, I couldn't, I, so I and, I, and I never really fit in because, once again, one group looked at me as white, the other group looked at me as black, and I, so I was friendless for many years, and so maybe my determination was to get the heck out of there. I did it. All right, so, um, <laughs> now, the one thing I want to really say about that is, you know, grades don't always reflect one's intelligence but rather their support system and environment. My grades were never a reflection of who I was. I feel like now I've learned more in the past seven years out of school than I ever learned while I was in it. I'm, I'm an avid reader. I used to be an avid reader when I was a kid, and 
I kind of got the habit back over the past few years. Now, 1992 to 1993, let's talk about the change in the environment. My environment changed in 1992. First off, middle school, as I stated, I hated middle school, it was horrible. I was bullied and picked on throughout, once again, I was in all the smart classes, I was an easy target uh, amongst uh, some, of, some of my peers. Uh, and a lot of kids, middle school, and I, once again, I'm a product, product of the public school system. I, I, I did public school every year except K-4 through first grade was private, and then after that I did all public. So I'm, I'm a product of public school. There were a lot of kids who I felt didn't come to learn. Uh, my home life changed. Fifth grade was the first time I ever heard my parents argue, and it only got worse after that. And the home environment all of a sudden became a battlefield. And me and my two younger sisters were caught in the middle of it. And so we didn't get the love and attention that we once had. So no one was reinforcing the education that we got in school when we got home because they were always bickering. My dad didn't want to come home. Uh, so sometimes I wouldn't see my dad till like two or three days when he came in late. And so it became a real battlefield. Now, prior to that, I believe I lived in a fantasy world. Looking back, I, live, I lived in the perfect world, which I now call a fantasy. Uh, I think I had a perfect childhood family. That everyone was nice and kind uh, and good. But middle school, my middle school years, that transition into my teenage adolescence was a real wake up call to life and life struggles. Now, as I stated earlier, or just a few moments ago, I am a product of the public school system. But when I graduated, I graduated with a 2.3 GPA. I had to go to summer school to finish. I only applied to one school, and I took the SAT. I did good, so they went ahead and uh, let me in, not based on GPA, but rather, wow, this kid, he actually looks pretty smart. So I went into that school. That was one thing my dad did when, when I was about to graduate. I said, Dad, I'm just going to work. No, you're going to college. Don't you? <laughs> okay. All right. So... Now, did the system fail me or did I fail the system? Now, one of the questions we talk about today, preparing the next generation to be future proof. Are we preparing youth for real life or are we preparing them for a fantasy? So, as I stated before, I had flashes of brilliance even when through my struggles. My last year of middle school, eighth grade, I made honor roll bo both quarters. Bullying just forced me to just go off by myself and I had to study. Uh, then high school started, fell right back off track. Uh, 11th grade, one of the greatest things my family ever did was move. We moved out of the city, my hometown, and I moved to Florence, South Carolina. So 11th grade, I, I was able to hit reset. And that was actually a life-saving thing for me. I've been able to hit reset four or five times, meaning I moved around, changed my environment, and, and was able to adapt or thrive under that new environment. Now, 11th grade, I started a new high school. I made honor roll the whole year. I was selected as uh, one of the mayor select students where I went through this program. I was a junior leadership program. But then I saw out of my home life and I said, I'm leaving. I moved out, got a job. Summer, summer of 11th grade, got two jobs. I think, no, actually, I got three jobs. And I told my parents when they decided to move back to my hometown, I said, I don't want to go. I'm going to stay here in Florence. That was a life lesson, living on my own with uh, my college roommates. That was <laughs> its own story. But that trend that I had, those flashes of brilliance didn't last. Um, as I stated before, I started to neglect myself. And once I started making money, I thought, what's the point in going to school? I'm making money. Now, the things that taught me that money were important was everything that I watched, read, and listened to. And you can always tell what a person is about based on what they watch, read, and listen to. I walk in somebody's house, I look at your bookshelf, I can know everything about you in a moment. And I do that with my friends. Sometimes I look at, so you like this, this, oh, how'd you know? Well, all your books revealed that. You love Kim Kardashian. Yeah, I do. Right, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, you have to, so the things I was consuming, the music I was listening to, the things I was watching on TV taught me 
you know, money over everything. I won't go to the exact quotes that they say, but they, 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 they hype greed, they hype money over everything else. Now, as in this, in this society, this is something that you as teachers and administrators in education have to deal with, have to struggle with. Within the school, you're trying to enforce certain values, but outside of that school, there are a number of values that fight against the values actually in education. Once again, what's in the magazines, what's, on, what's in the movies, what's in music, those things are actually contrary. I, I never hear Beyonce do a homework song. Homework is good. Never seen it. <laughs> ne nev I hadn't seen that song yet. So, <laughs> now, with that being said, talking about fantasy versus reality, there was a great tweet that came out a few years back, uh, and I just, I really was beholden by it. And I said, I'm glad I learned about parallelograms instead of taxes. It really comes in handy this parallelogram season. <laughs> it says a lot to me. Now, my question to you all, outside of the classroom, how many of you all use parallelograms on a daily basis, on a regular basis, outside of the classroom? Wow. How many of you outside of the classroom have encountered parallelograms in the past five years? Okay, I got, I got three hands. All right. Oh, you, what, you were looking at a railroad tech? Ooh, parallelogram. <laughs> but the point is this. We are teaching things that people actually don't use in their adult, their adult life. Now, how many of y'all had to deal with taxes in the past year? I deal with taxes every time you get your paycheck. Who's FICA? Who is that? Uh, so, so every time you get your paycheck, you deal with taxes. Yet, how many of us actually teach the tax system in public school education? We got one hand. Uh, that's fine. I, I, that's typically one or none. We aren't enforcing the values that people actually need to survive and thrive in the United States of America. As I stated before, I excelled in elementary school. And I actually found out what my talents were. And I always tell people, whenever you're confused about life, go back to your childhood. And whatever you were good at then, you're probably still good at it. Now, the things I was good at, number one, I was a, I was a good writer. I loved to read. I was pretty good at public speaking. Uh, I consider myself a visionary. Teachers would have a project, and I'd have the project done in my head before I actually did it. And I would execute it and it would come out pretty good. Uh, I was good at debating. I guess that's one reason why I went to law school, but even though that skill doesn't really apply. Now, as I kept going through school, though, instead of honing in on my talents and my passions, they took me off on this road away from the things that I was good at, away from the things that really drove me, that really moved me. And that's why I had flashes of brilliance. The flashes of brilliance actually came from the classes that really interested me. You see my class, it'd be C, 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 D, A, A. Like, who has report cards like that? And you see the two classes, one is like creative writing or, or, or some sort of public speaking class. And I'm killing it because it, it, it fueled the flame from my childhood. But you, I'm sitting in calculus, which I actually went to calculus. I'm like, what is this? I'm like, just, just, I'm just, it's not, it's not engaging me. I haven't had to use calculus since I left uh, college. Haven't used it at all. I don't know how it helped me, but you know, they want us to be well-rounded learners. Now, focus on your passion. Now, my question based on this tweet and this slide. I'm pretty sure everybody's seen this slide before. But are we preparing our youth for real life challenges based on their talents and passions? Or are we just giving them a generalized education? And when I say generalized, meaning we're requiring everybody to do the same thing, even though we're different. Our fair selection, uh, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. 
and only one person can really do it. One person could get up the tree, but they can't climb it. Well, only one person can really do it. Everybody else is going to fail. Why? Because we aren't looking at what they're good at, what makes them tick, what makes them special. Do you think that, is, does anybody disagree with that's how the education system is currently operating? Wow. All right. I'm in the right place then. All right. So <laughs> now, do we believe, we say that we have a creed here in the United States. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But is that just a statement or is there, is there some truth behind that? Do we believe that all human beings are exactly alike? Extrinsically in some ways, but internally everybody's different. Every single person is different. If you look at me and all my siblings, you'd be like, yeah, you are really different. <laughs> I, everybody's different. Nobody's exactly alike. I have some traits of my mother, meaning I don't like to go to sleep at all. I stay up all night. Uh, and my wife drives my wife insane. I have some traits of my father. I won't tell you what those traits are. Now, <laughs> although we have been created equally, skill, talent, passion, and ability-wise, we are not the same. There is a quote that is attributed to Einstein that typically goes with this. I don't know if it's true or not, but it says, everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fist by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. I don't know if he actually said that, but I do agree with the general premise. Everybody is good at something. The key is to identify and help our young people hone and refine that talent and passion into a skill. That is part of the process of, and that is part of the process of helping them to become future proof. Now, uh, they called me in December, I believe, the, the, about this presentation, maybe November. So mentally, I've been working on this presentation for a while. Uh, I, 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 like I said, I'm an avid reader. It forced me to buy a book earlier than was on my Amazon uh, wish list. Uh, and my wife, another book, but it's, it's, for, it's for a presentation. Don't freak out, right? <laughs> so. And, you know, I was really, I, I had what I wanted to say, but then something happened a week and a half ago that really moved me. Now, everybody knows about the gun shooting that happened in Florida. And I'll admit, when it first happened, I thought it was just going to be the same thing, thoughts and prayers and thoughts and prayers. So I watched it for a moment. I said, I'm not going to get wrapped up in this and get emotionally tied in. So the same thing happened. But then something amazing happened. All of a sudden, the young people said, enough is enough. Because if we wait around on adults to change some things, it'll never happen. And they got mad and said, you're either with us or against us. We are not going to accept life as it is. We are going to change it. And then I realized something that's always been true, but they actually never teach you in school. Change in the United States of America over the past 200 years has always started and initiated with young people. It's the adults who sustain it, but it always starts with the young. If you look at the civil rights movement, one of the last major social changes that happened, and you look at the women's rights movement, other stuff, it always started with young people. For example, Although Rosa Parks gets credit as the lady who refused to give her her seat on the bus, there were four young ladies that did it before her. And if you don't know your history, Rosa Parks actually didn't end bus segregation. What happened was when she refused to give up her seat on the bus, they tried to take it to state court in Alabama. And Alabama sided with Montgomery. Uh, yeah, we're gonna keep it the same. So then E.D. Nixon, the president of the NAACP went back and got those four other girl, five other girls who had earlier refused to get their seat on the bus and he pushed them out because he wanted a perfect person and he took it to federal court. And it was those five ladies and their case that overturned bus 
segregation in Montgomery, Alabama. Most people don't know that story because we teach history completely wrong in our classrooms. We don't, history should empower us. It shouldn't just be a story. It should empower us. If you look at the, the sit-ins in the restaurants, that started in 1961 with students who went to school in Greensboro, North Carolina. And guess what? They went one day, they didn't get any press, but they came right back the next day and sat down again. And they started that. And then that force, CORE, Martin Luther King, Urban League, NAACP to get involved and play their role. But it was always started with young people. And the way we teach history now is just like everything's fine, everything's perfect. No, we got some real problems. I gave a presentation last week, uh, right at the day after the shooting, or two days after the shooting. I didn't, and we just had a conversation. We asked the youth, tell me, what do you think is wrong with this country? And we got a, a board about as long as this curtain filled it up with everything that they saw wrong. So the question I then said to them, what are we going to do about it? Now, somewhere along the way, these youths had a good teacher. And I don't mean actually in the classroom. I mean just someone who actually cared to teach them about life. It could have been a parent. It could have been a teacher. It could have been a minister. It could have been a neighbor. It could have been a grandmother. I don't know. But someone inspired them to say enough is enough. These kids are what I would call future proof. Now, how do I define that? My definition. Future proof to me, because they didn't give me the definition before, uh, before I started, means that when the hard times come, and they definitely will, we are able to resist, adjust, change, and adapt to those circumstances and persevere despite the challenges incurred by those circumstances. Once again, it doesn't mean that the hard times won't come. But if you prepare those you for those hard times, emotionally, financially, politically, legally, et cetera, they will be able to make it through. We have many hard times if we transition from childhood to adulthood. And if we prepare our children for the hard times, they'll know how to embrace them when those challenges do come. One of our biggest problems in our transition from childhood to adulthood is that no one prepared me and a lot of young people for the challenges of life. No one prepared me for racism and how to challenge it, how to face it. Actually, we didn't discuss racism. We talked about it as if it was an old thing that was dead and gone. King took care of that, don't worry about it. And now they're teaching the kids, well, it came back up, then Obama came, and now it's over again. So it's like, <laughs> like just keep rising up and just, new person comes down to slay it. All right, so no one prepared me for fakeness. The people that smile in your face and talk behind your back. You know, they don't teach a class on that. No one prepared me how to fight against power structures. My position, once again, it's a position that if you really want to do the work, you have to fight against the status quo. And you have to really try to challenge people to change the way civil and human rights apply to all persons here in Des Moines or here in the United States. Now, when I push back, they push back too. Ah, it's fascist budget. Oh, God damn it. Nobody told me about that. Right? How, how do you prepare for these things, these power structures that you weren't taught about in school? No one taught me how to live and thrive in a capitalist system. Actually, the whole time I was in school, they never even used the word capitalism. And we live in a capitalist system. We'll talk more about capitalism in a moment. <laughs> People prepared me to respect authority and not question it. That's how I got fired from a job once. My manager said, when people walk in, we're slow on sales, you need to give everybody a discount. I said, that don't sound right. But I was taught to respect authority, he is my boss. So when the district manager walks in, who's giving all these discounts? Uh, <laughs> I was taught that the world was as it is, and my place in society was to act, perform, talk, and learn according to it, and nothing more. We teach history as if it's a story of yesteryear, but that is far from the truth. History is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us, we are our history. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. That is a very true statement. For example, 
We, this is an example of how we are a part of our history. All right, this actually comes from a textbook, pre-civil rights movement, probably about the 1940s, 1950s, called The Five Races of Men. All right, anybody see anything wrong with this? You can, you can chime in if you like. Very stereotypical. In what fashion? What regard? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else? Thank you. Center on the white people. All right. Yes. Very true. That's that's the focus. Anything else? Not not inclusive. What do you mean? Yes, that is exactly, that, that's, you know, for, for all, race is a made, made up concept that they tried to fit in these social constructs that actually don't fit. Now, but they, th this is what they believe were the five races of men. I meet people all the time, we're a race, you want to be part of something, isn't real? Like, yeah, we give us credit, all right. Yes, not women, all right. As you did the first thing when, when I agree, I have women. I, 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 <laughs> anything else? Yes, ma'am. No intermixing, right? All right, so I'm going to finish it off because I do have a limited time. But if you look at the white, you said it was stereotypical, but then you look at the white couple and they look what? Modern. Modern. Yeah, everybody's got their stereotypical garb except for the white people. So if we're being honest, why don't they look like this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, if, we, if we're being honest, you know, Viking conquerors. Yeah, if we're being honest. Another thing, where do they put the man and the woman on this? Did anybody notice that? If you look, the man is by, 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 like the, by the city, meaning he's the worker, and they put the woman on the side of the home. And once again, these are things that they implant in your mind. Baby boomers saw this photo in a textbook and believed that Women belong at home, men belong in the workplace, and this is how African pe people look, this is how uh, uh, Asian people look, this is how they, they, they have all these stereotypes that are taught, that were taught to us. And some of these things still happen. I grabbed my niece's textbook about a year ago. She was in a social studies class, and they were saying, I opened the social studies book because I love, I, I love history. And they were talking about the Iraq war and how it was good for the country. I was like, who, what, what? <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, God, it's still happening. So these, these, things that, these are things that are being implanted in our minds that we aren't even aware of. So how do we make people, how do we make the next generation future-proof? If we want to make the next generation future-proof, we have to show them the world as it is. We got to get real with the children. Then we have to teach them to shape how to shape the world to what they desire it to be. And then we have to identify their passions and their talents in order to do that. And then show them how to capitalize on their talents and hone their skills in order to get capital. And then also we have to give them that non-education education in order to thrive in America. So I'm gonna walk through some of this. Now, the world as it is. Anybody know who this is? Oh, I'm, in, I'm in full of educators. Somebody got to know this. Who? No. It does kind of look like him. I, I get it. <laughs> All right. So this is Horace Mann. Anybody know who Horace Mann is? I got, I, mo most people say no. I heard it too. Yeah, no, I have no idea who this is. All right. <laughs> Horace Mann is considered somewhat the godfather of public education. He was the person that believed that everyone should have a right to an education. Uh, he said, a man is guilty of the wrong which he could have prevented, but did not as if for which his own hand is perpetuated. They then knowingly withhold sustenance from a newborn child and he dies, are guilty of infanticide. And by the same reason, they who refuse to enlighten the intellect of the rising generation are guilty of degrading the human race. They who refuse to train up a child in the way they should go are training up incendiaries and madmen to destroy property and life and to invade and pollute 
the sanctuaries of society. This person really believed in the power of education and what it was supposed to do. Uh, he was uh, the Secretary of Education for Massachusetts, and he was really a progressive in regards to what education could and should be. Now, problem was Horace Mann had this utopian view of education, but he ran up against a power structure that did not view it the same way. The power structure wanted people that could read and count so they, put, so they could become economic units. And what do I mean by that? Meaning they wanted some workers who are obedient that could at least count and learn how to read in order to follow instructions. That's all they wanted. He went and traveled all of Europe, went to Prussia, went to a number of places and saw how school was fun and it was passionate and people loved to learn. And he tried to change school to that same kind of model here in the United States. And the power structure pushed back and said, we don't want that. We want docile workers. That was exactly what they wanted, people who were obedient. They didn't want people to get creative and learn all these new things because if you learn a lot of new stuff, then you can disrupt the system. And therefore, a lot of the things that Horace Mann wanted to do in public education never came to pass. Once again, when public education really took off, public education took off as a response to the industrial revolution, the transition from farming to industry. But are we still in the industrial age? No, we're in, the we're in the technological age. But we actually still teach, for the most part, like we're in the Industrial Revolution. We're in the technological revolution now. You have to know science. You have to know technology in order to really thrive. STEAM, the whole thing they're teaching right now. He called education the great equalizer. But I would say now that will is kind of out of balance because education is not preparing us for the current challenges. Now, America has what form of government? Democracy. I heard that? All right, I heard another one. All right, so everybody say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. Y'all ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the, stop, right there. It doesn't say to the democracy to the republic. Somebody said, I heard representative somewhere in there. That, that, that's all a republic is. A republic is a representative form of government where you democratically elect the people who make decisions for you. Now, a real democracy is you make decisions for yourself when you vote. But now we elect people, put them in power, and we want them to represent our interests. Biggest problem with that is, though, you vote them in power, but who are they really actually loyal to? Their party because their party gives them the funds to do what they need to do in order to stay elected. But we don't teach people that. We teach people, we live in a democracy. I'm like, where did y'all get that from? They taught me the same thing. That is not true. We live in a republic, a democratic republic, but a republic. And you've been saying the words to the pleasure leaders and never knew what that, what, to the republic. Well, I guess that's just something we call it, no. We live in a republic. Now, once again, showing people the world as it is. We have to be honest with the youth. We have to teach them the difference between a republic and a democracy. We also have to show them the challenges economically that we're facing. What do I mean? Uh, the gains lately have only come at the top. Most people, you and I, some of us, you know, there are always exceptions. Once again, excuse me, I'm making money. I, I, I get it. All right. But only households earning $200,000 or more in 2004 saw a gain. 2014 saw a gain in their income. The 90th percentile earning $157,000 or more also saw gains. But people at the 80th percentile and below saw a negative change in income. And more, more so middle class, lower class persons that hit the most. Now, if you're trying to teach them train students for jobs of the industrial revolution and the technological age, they're going to remain right here. But we aren't talking to people about the economic challenges that we face at this time. 
You know, Trump uh, has been highlighting that employment has gone, uh, the, the, the unemployment rate is going down. But what he fails to mention is that most of the employment has been in temporary jobs or part-time jobs. Did you know that if you cut grass for somebody next week and you get $20, they consider you employed? That's <laughs> a joke, right? Yeah. <laughs> Literally, they consider you considered employed. There are things that people just don't know that people use to skew those numbers. And the unemployment rate isn't accurate anyway because only people seeking jobs. There are a lot of people giving up, just not, not even trying to get a job. They don't count those people anymore. Now, we're earning. We have more education than we ever had. Remember, I said I had three degrees. That means I'm heavily en enslaved to student loan debt. But we're actually earning less money than the previous generation. So some of you are baby boomers, some of you are Gen Xers, but my generation, the millennial generation, we're the first generation projected to do worse than the generation before us. The first time in history. We actually see a negative gain from the education, although we've seen an increase in education. We're more educated, but we're making less funding. Now, even as we dive in, oh, skip the slide. All right. Wages in the United States of America have remained flat for years. Actually, since like the early 1970s, wages have remained flat. This is the last time they, they have not risen with productivity levels. What changed in 1972? Like, I'm, I'm not supposed to be learning. Gosh, I wasn't here to learn. Come on, ladies, what happened in 1972? Yeah, yes, oh, women started to get the rights, e equal rights under employment. They're still fighting for it. They still don't have it. W women make 78 cents to every dollar a man makes, and you break it out. Black women make 64 cents to every 78 cents a white woman makes, and Latinas make 58 cents to every 64 cents. It's, Still not equal. Now, so we've seen productivity levels rise, but real wages have remained low for years. Why? Because, okay, women want to work, well, now I don't have to give you no raise. Your wife got a job. You don't need no money. <laughs> Come on. Anybody know how much it costs to raise your first child from zero to 18? Yeah, that's actually pretty close, about $250,000. <laughs> Then it costs even more, right? <laughs> it costs a lot of money to have kids. Therefore, I have none. And so, <laughs> but these are things we're not talking about. We're telling people, get a job. But our wages have been flat for years. We're telling people, get an education. But when my parents went to school, they could work a summer job and pay school off. You get a summer job now and try to pay your student loan, they'd be calling, so you didn't pay the full balance? <laughs> <So> <laughs> Times have changed, but we have not changed with the times. What do I mean by that? Once again, showing people the way the world is presently. Going back to productivity. Productivity is high, but black men make very low in their medium wage growth compared to the actual production rate. We actually make, compared to the production rate, a negative seven. White men, negative three. Black women, 12%. White women, 30%. Once again, still does not equate to productivity. And the one reason why theirs is much higher is because they actually started out the gate with like a zero. We, we didn't start out at zero. Most men didn't start out at zero. Black men started lower than white men, but we didn't start out at zero. White women went from not working to working, so they see a arise. But once again, as productivity continues to rise, women will actually see their rates start to go down because they won't stay on trend with productivity. But once again, we're telling people to get jobs when making an hourly wage isn't cutting it. Do you know that the average American cannot handle a $500 emergency? 65% of America cannot handle a $500 to $1,000 emergency. How many can handle it? Give me, my, give me some money. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. But we are preparing people for real things. Now let's talk about taxes. We talked about taxes before. Now, the higher your income, 
the higher the percentage of your income that you don't actually have to pay in regards to taxes. Payroll taxes come out of a check. It's a flat rate from 500,000 to 100,000. Doesn't go up. Every dollar you make over $127,000, you don't have to pay taxes on it. So the more money you make, the more money you bank. We don't teach people that. Uh, taxes, once again, is a man-made concept. It's a human construct made by people in power who decide what taxes should be. Now, once again, if you're rich, you don't want a lot of taxes. Hey, I'm, I'm raking in the dough. Hey, everything after 120000 you don't pay tax on. All right, yeah, good deal. All right. You can cut those deals, but when you're not in power and you think we live in a democracy rather than a republic, you get left out. Corporations, if you look at them, corporate income taxes, they made $2 trillion in 2016 and only paid $300 billion. We paid $1.6 trillion. We, everyday workers, earners, I'm in a class full, I'm in a room full of administrators and teachers, yet we paid $1.26 million in income taxes, meaning what they, what we, when we filed taxes on the year at the end of, on, in April. Now, in addition to that, our payroll taxes, we paid $1.2 trillion. So if you do the math, we paid more than corporations actually made. Wait, well, actually, we, we, we paid more than corporations paid, way more. The average business only pays about 15% in taxes. We pay 40. How was that right? How was that fair? Are we talking to our students about that? To question and understand why things are the way they are. These are things that no one talk, taught to me. Yet, when we want to talk about minimum wage, they talk about greed. It's all political. But we don't get down to the nitty gritty of politics in school. Even if you go to college and take a political science, because I was a political science minor. I did great in political science, by the way. Um, politics is the management of the conflict which occurs when groups war over resources. Resources include money and land. Politics is just a passing around of resources. They say politics is war without bloodshed, and they say it's war, and war is politics with bloodshed. You're still fighting over those resources. Who gets them? Who doesn't? And as I stated before, we never, when I was in school, discussed capitalism and how to survive and thrive in a capitalist society. Not once. The basic premise of capitalism is to make a profit by any means necessary. The goal of corporations is to make money. Capitalism demands competition, selfishness, and sometimes, in many ways, mean-spiritedness. So please understand something. Remember what I said about Horace Mann. He wanted to transform public education. But capitalism demands that a few people profit off the backs and labor of the many. Capitalism is not compatible with equality, is not compatible with equity, and is no matter how hard we try to make it. And I haven't even mentioned automation, technological changes. We've lost a lot of jobs in the United States of America to automation, meaning we've moved from human beings doing the work to machines. And that is a trend that is going to continue. So what are we preparing people for the jobs of tomorrow for? Are we preparing them for the work problems and challenges that do not yet exist? Or are we preparing them for the past? Now, one of the things we talk about race relations. Uh, race relations are actually worse now than they were in 1992 during the Rodney King uh, L.A. riots. Despite what they're selling us on MLK and Obama, race relations are doing worse, not better. One of the things they don't prepare you for is if you're a black male trying to get a job, you are less likely to be called back if you have an ethnic sounding name. You're also a white male with a prison record is 50% uh, more likely to be called back as an African-American without a jail record. They overlook qualified persons with ethnic names uh, than they would a biblical name. Now, some things to try to even the scale we talked about uh, were 
uh, affirmative action, allowing people who have been historically discriminated against to have the opportunity to advance in education. But even that is not true because Horace Mann said education is the great equalizer. It actually doesn't determine to be true. If you look at the trends, a white person that has less than a high school uh, diploma has about $34,000 in wealth. A black person, same amount, is, has about $1,500 in wealth. You look at a, a white person with a, co with a, with a high school diploma, $78,000 in wealth. 30, and a black person has 3,200. Some college, a white person has 86,000, a black person has 7,100. A college degree, white person typically has about $180,000 in wealth, a black person, 23,000. Post college, the black person finally surpasses the person with a high school diploma. He gets 84,000 while a person with a high school diploma has about $87,000 in wealth. While a white person with a post college degree has about $293,000 in wealth. Yet we wanna say education, get your education, but we aren't preparing them for the real challenges of life. And debt <laughs> is a huge challenge in life. Trying to survive and thrive with where we have uh, we, where we just had the, the, the 2008 uh, housing crisis, where we have a student loan bubble that's on the way. We have about $1.8 trillion in student loan debt. 30% of people who have student loans can't afford to pay them back. We have uh, student loans actually just surpassed credit card as the number two uh, uh, accumulation of debt in the United States. Uh, and mortgages is number one. So we still have a lot of struggles despite what we're selling. Yet we wonder why certain people can't catch up because they have to go through so many hoops and hurdles just to get a free ride that some people already have. So we talk about the world as it is. We have to help people shape the world to what they desire it to be. Now, what do all these people have in common other than the color of skin? <laughs> I fought for what they wanted. Yes, very true. I'm going I'm to take that. But I want to be a little more specific. They were all rule breakers for justice. They broke the rules because they saw the rules were unfair. And that's what these kids are trying to do right now in Stone Man Douglas. Yeah, we don't care about the rules. You're either with us or against us, and we're going to fight for what we believe in. If you want to change the world, you have to learn to bend the rules to shape the world to how you want it to be. If you really want to progress, you have to learn the rules and bend them. Listen to them and say, you know what? I reject all these. All these people, in some way or another, she was a fugitive, uh, wanted Harriet Tubman. Uh, that's E.E. Nixon, the gentleman I mentioned earlier. He went to prison for uh, the Montgomery bus boycott. So did Rosa Parks. Martin Luther King spent some time in solitary confinement, almost got him on tax evasion in Alabama in 1950, but he actually got off on that. Frederick Douglass is also wanted as well. But these people all broke the rules. They didn't follow and accept the rules as they were. They decided that they were going to change them. Now, I want to talk about this one, because this is actually near and dear to my heart when I first saw this. But people change. Once again, uh, and so, so you should never give up on people. Malcolm X is the example I use. He, uh, you know, I always say they whitewashed King and blackwashed Malcolm. Uh, but Malcolm X was a person who evolved over his lifetime. Uh, he was a person who went to jail for uh, theft and prostitution and a number of other things. Then he became a, mi a minister for the Nation of Islam. But then, and then they seem to stop right there. But actually, he left the Nation of Islam in 1964 and said that his brothers are black, white, red, yellow, brown. Never read that in the textbook. He also said that I will fight with anyone who wants to change the miserable conditions on this earth. Tried to unite with King uh, down in Selma, but was assassinated a few weeks. He came down and spoke with Coretta and then went back up to New York and was assassinated two weeks later. But he was trying to change as a person. And so when I read the, autobiog the autobiography of Malcolm X, it was a very inspiring book which helped me to 
change. I'm still not smiling, though. I'm, I'm always a very serious person. <laughs> but people evolve. People change. The road is rough, but if people have a good foundation or a reformed foundation, they can make it through the tough times. Now, one reason why I was able to come future proof was I identified my passion, found my talent, and I'm learning how to capitalize and hone on those skills and talents. M remember what I said, I realized what my talents were a long time ago. All I've done is go back to my roots and they've helped me to progress and stick true to myself. So if you want people to become future proof, you have to identify their passions, you have to find their, their, their talents and learn how to intertwine those two. My wife, when she first came to the United States, she's like, I gotta get a job. No, you don't. <laughs> you, need to, you need to figure out what your passion is. What do you think it is? Why do you think I married you? Love is not the answer, by the way. <laughs> You're a great cook. <laughs> so um, I think my wife's the greatest cook in the world. Um, but now she's honing her talent. Her talent is cooking. And as she serves people and gives them food, she actually gets happy. So she planning the flames of her passion. The most deadly of all possible sins is the mutilation of a child's spirit. Don't be a dream killer, but rather a dream builder. So what does this mean? Going back to talking about myself. One of the things I mentioned earlier was that I realized what I like to do in elementary school, but as I progressed through high school and middle school, they took you off that path and you started getting all this generalized education. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But one thing I've learned, especially in Des Moines public schools, is the teacher have a lot of control over the content and the way that the students can actually present the material that they're learning. What you should do is hone in and find out what their talents and passions are and let them present based upon that. I'm a very visual person. I've, I've created videos and presentations for the work that I do. And that's just how I communicate to people. And that's helped me to progress. You have to figure out what people's talents and passions are and teach them how to capitalize on that. And capitalize, I really mean how to make money. We live in a capitalist system. Therefore, once people figure out what they're good at, how to make money, I, once they figure out what they're good at, we have to instruct them on how to make money at it. Now, that non-education education, and I'll be wrapping up uh, soon. We have to give that non-education education if you want people to become future-proof. And I call it the non-education education because it's not anything that they're teaching in school, but it's the things that will determine what happens to you as you matriculate into adulthood. One thing we never teach people about is local government. I'm actually really appreciative of Barack Obama because I walk into schools now and I ask kids that look like me what they want to be. Still my majority entertainment sport. But then I have a few hands go up. I want to be president. I'm like, yeah, that's good. But the problem is I'm sitting in a room with 30 people and six people want to be president. They all the same age. <laughs> there can only be one president at a time. And I ask, why do you want to? I want to make a difference. Why can't you make a difference right here in Des Moines or wherever I, wherever I speak at? You can be mayor. What is a mayor? It's the same thing, but right here in this city. You mean I can stay here? Yes, you can stay here, yes. And people nev they nev they never even thought about what a mayor is. I met a student once who said I wanted to be the secretary of education. I said, you, you have family that has matriculated through and you know, done state education? No, nah, no, nah, I want to be the first. Why not be superintendent? It's the same thing at a local level. And I don't know if y'all know anything about local government, but local government is a political machine. There are a few businesses that control a lot of things that happen in the city. And because most people are never taught local government, they only taught the branches of government for, for um, federal government, they don't understand the impact they can have right here in this city, right here in this state, in changing their environment. We are, ne we are never taught that. How many people teach a class on local government in school? Yeah, nobody ever raises their hand. <laughs> we don't teach people what a city council person does, what a city manager does, what, what the mayor does, what a city planner is. I, have, I know a lot of white kids that have family members who are city planners, and they got an easy lane through the graduation through college because they know what they want to do because they met people that are city planners. That seems pretty cool, a city engineer. We, we don't, we've never encountered and interact with those people, so we're shooting for the star. I want to be Michael Jordan. 
There's only one Michael Jordan. But they're alumni of city engineers and city planners that we never even think to tell people and train people about. Capitalism. We have to teach people that in the United States of America, capital is king. And if you want to thrive in this country, you have to either be a creator or a producer, not a worker. You can never be rich working for somebody else. That person will always have more money than you that you're working for. So tap into their talents, hone their skills, and they will become creators and producers of new things and new challenges here in the United States. Republic versus democracy, banking, finance, stocks and bonds. I was never taught that in school. And I took finance courses in my MBA program. The MBA program just teaches you how to work with people too. It's at a high level. Now, how to start a business. You want to grow wealth? Start a business. But we aren't teaching people that. And that was actually a skill they used to have. My dad said they used to have when he was in school. He said you how to start businesses. But they've actually taken those things away and give you this generalized education that really isn't giving you anything back. Are we really preparing students to be future proof here in the United States of America, to thrive in the United States of America? Building credit. When you're in high school, they judge you by your credit score. When you're in college, no, excuse me. When you're in high school, they judge you by your GPA. When you're in college, they judge you by your GPA. Once you become an adult, they judge you by your credit score. Because you got to get a loan to get a house, to get a car. You walk in, oh, 600? Sorry, okay. <laughs> we aren't teaching people that. Now, we have to teach people about debt. Debt is the new form of slavery. And what do I mean by that? As long as you're indebted, you can never be free. I know the first thing I'm going to do when I pay off my student loans, if that ever happens, I'm leaving the country. Just done. It's just, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> nothing, nothing holding me back. If I want to come back, I can now, because my credit score will be OK. <laughs> so, but we don't talk about that. We don't talk about student loans. We have to teach people these things. And we also got to talk about discipline. What I mean by discipline is the organization and skills to get whatever, whatever you want in life. Because all these things are attainable. Understanding local government, understanding capitalism, understanding the difference between a republic and a democracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we aren't given that non-education education. There's so many things we could be teaching in our classroom to help students to thrive, but we aren't doing that. But if you really want people to be future-proof, you have to show them the world as it is, the world that we're presently living in. You have to teach them to shape that world to what they desire it to be. Learn the rules, then learn how to break them in order to form a more perfect union that you believe it should be. You have to identify their passions, find their talents, show them how to capitalize on their talents and hone their skills, give them a non-education education, the skills you really need to survive in America, thrive in America. We can get by not knowing capitalism and stocks and bonds. We want you to thrive. So are we preparing our youth for real life? Are we preparing them for fantasy? Are we preparing them to be adults and handle adult challenges? Are we preparing them to, to solve new challenges of society? Once again, we're in the technological age. Are we teaching them how to build apps and new computers? All those things. I'm proud of these people because they're not accepting the way the world is. They're actually fighting back and saying, I don't accept how life is and I want to change it. And I want you all to do that as you're dealing with your students, as you're dealing with your youth. Show them life as it is, show them how they can change it. And then maybe we can knock down this dang tree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>